So, first of all, very welcome to this afternoon, this very, very hot afternoon, uh, to Claire Hall and this talk I'm going to do in a minute. Um, it's a very opportune time to do this talk because, first of all, it's uh, our 50th anniversary. We've had lots of celebration for our life members, and the talk will be given by one of our life members. It's also not just a 50th anniversary of Claire Hall, but this is 200th celebration of the birth of John Bronte. So there we are, it's one of our anniversaries. And we're so lucky that as part of the anniversary of the CA came our life member all the way from Australia, uh, Professor Christine Alexander, who's dedicated so much of her life to understand and discover more about Charles Bronte. And I think the thing that many scholars wonder is about how could uh, such an isolated house, such an isolated family, and such an isolated location uh, give rise to all these creative, uh, imaginative people, if not geniuses. So hopefully Christine will shed some light on that today. Uh, she's done a lot of detective work uh, that she's going to share with us today. So I would like to hand it to you, Christine. Thank you. Charlotte Bronte's Life Centenary is this year, and I've been heavily involved in it up and down the country and in a few other countries. And this talk is essentially a gesture by Claire Hall to mark the celebration, which I think is really nice. So thank you. Yes. Um, I was asked to give an informal talk, but uh, when I was told there were more than about three or four people coming, I thought I'd better write a few notes. So I've imposed a, a bit of a structure on this. And I am going to speak here according to this structure, basically. I'm going to um, focus on how Charlotte Bronte became a writer and how I personally came to encounter her life and works. And this is what I was asked. So first of all, the background, then discovering Charlotte, then and her ambition and struggle in life. And within this scheme, I'll trace my own personal journey uh, with Charlotte and her writings. I'm going to refer to her by her Christian name. I'm not sure if this is still politically <laughs> correct, but in fact, to, to distinguish her from her siblings. There are so many Brontes, it's hard to know which one we're talking about. So, first, let me set the scene, and in fact, a personal scene. Because this is me. <laughs> I don't normally start academic lectures at all with anything to do with me, uh, but this is an exception. Uh, this is just a month ago, uh, about five minutes from the Bronte Parsonage, or no, sorry, not a month, um, in February. <laughs> I was there a month ago, but it was a little difficult to miss. Uh, it's along the road from the village of Howard in West Yorkshire. It's midwinter, it's February. And this is one of the very few fine days that I was actually able to go for a walk. It was a three-week stay, and I was working on the manuscripts. Most of the days were wet and warm, mm -hmm. and with almost horizontal slit, and I'm, I'm not joking, it was quite extraordinary. Most of the days, in fact, I could quote the beginning of Jane Eyre. There was no possibility of taking a walk that day. The cold winter wind had brought with it clouds so sombre and a rain so penetrating that further outdoor exercise was now out of the question. On the few days that I was able to venture out of the parsonage, I could walk up the track to the moor, this is exactly what it was like then, and out onto the top of Peniston Hill. This is a walk that the Brontes did from their earliest childhood and that they continue to do throughout their lives, both for exercise and for pleasure. Their father, the Reverend Patrick Bronte, was a product of the Romantic period. He was born in a humble crofter's cottage in Ireland, and he managed to make his way here to St John's College, Cambridge, and to become an Anglican clergyman. <coughs> he was probably the single most important influence on Charlotte. He subscribed to Wordsworth's view that the beauties of nature are a beneficent force. And he allowed his children to roam freely on the moors, accompanied by a servant and later by the family dog. 
Locals reported that he often took his children with him on rambles among the hills, observing and recording natural phenomena such as the eruption of the bog at Crow Hill on the moor behind the parsonage in 1824. This was a significant event. He recorded how he watched a very strange storm develop. He felt the trembling of the earth and he feared for the safety, of course, of his three children who were out walking. The anxious father frantically set out um, in search of them. A seven foot high torrent of mud, heat, and water had simply swept down the valley, narrowly missing the children who were sheltering with a servant in the porch of Pondon Hall, which in fact is the site that Emily Bronte faced, the site of Wyvern Heights. This actually was the same sodden bog high on the hill behind the parsonage that I encountered this figure. And the locals I talked to at Pondon Hill Hall said that there had been so much rain in England this winter that they were very afraid that again they would have another bog burst, just like the one in the town of Brontes. So it was really quite an interesting coincidence. They were extremely wild. It's very hard to walk in the as you can see how sodden it is, and yet we're very high up. Nature and the Howard landscape had a huge impact on Charlotte Hodges. And in fact on her writing, as it did on that of her sisters. Like Jane Eyre, she speaks of the natural landscape as a familiar face. A character that she misses intensely when she's away from home. It's also a character that's imbued with spiritual meaning. Not simply the 18th century idea of the genius of the place, but something much more profound, much more elemental. This was the age, you recall, of natural theology. It sanctioned the study of nature as a means of revering the earthly grandeurs and design of creation. Natural theology informed Mr. Bronte's attitude to nature. And it's derived in part from his books by the naturalists Buick, Audubon, Goldsmith, and White of Silver, all read and recommended by Charlotte to her friends. Like the young Jane Eyre, Charlotte Bronte poured over pages of Thomas Buick, in his, particularly his history of British birds. She didn't just study them and copy them. In fact, like this, this plate uh, that she copied of one of his birds and added the colours, because of course it was woodcuts, birds woodcuts. But also, um, she imagined and used the moral narratives of his quirky little vignettes of the everyday life. This is one of the ones she copied. Um, you, you probably know various vignettes to you in his history of British birds, but they're tiny little illustrations that children mm -hmm. used to study them in great detail and then enlarge them and write them. This is her fisherman, sheltering against the rain. Later, when Jane Eyre um, wanders, the, wanders destitute on the moors, she turns to the universal mother, this is what she's called, nature, for comfort and rest. She says, nature seemed to me benign and good. I thought she loved me, outcast as I was. You probably remember that passage when she's wandering on the walls, completely destitute, she's got nowhere to go, to get more food, etc. She finds real comfort in nature, and it's, it's quite an important passage in terms of romanticism. Jane, and presumably her author, subscribed to the belief that the hand of providence was in every page of the great book of nature, a phrase that simply echoes everywhere in Charlotte's letters and to her early life. Charlotte's first biographer, a friend and fellow novelist, Elizabeth Gaskell, begins her fam famous uh, biography with a vivid picture of Howard's village. She says, The traveller can see it for two miles before he arrives, for it is situated on the side of a steep hill, with a background of dun and purple moors, rising and sweeping away yet higher than the church which is built at the very summit of the narrow street. Um, the hill is going up this way to the top of the moors. I can't quite see this hill. 
this, and this is the church and the parsonage is on here. You walk out onto the walls, and this is where that first photo was here. Uh, Gaskell goes on, the flagstones with which it is paved are placed in ways in order to give a better hold to the horse's feet. And even with this hill, they seem to be in constant danger of slipping backwards. The old stone houses are high compared to the width of the street, which makes an abrupt turn before reaching the more level ground at the head of the village. At the top, there is first the church, then the Sunday school on the right here, where Charlotte Bronte was chief superintendent at the age of 16, and the crowded graveyard that um, Gaskell says is so terribly full of upright tombstones. And it still is. Um, we've only got a fraction showing here, it's just covered in tombstones. And then at the end of the road, the parsonage, and beyond that, the moors. It was up this steep main street that the Bronte family came in 1820, in a wagon with all their possessions, slowly climbing the hill towards the parsonage at the top. Five little children and a mother, Mariah Bramble, soon to be dead with an evening. And um, yeah, she was dead within a year of pelvic sepsis, causing um, caused by too rapid childhood. Charlotte was five when she lost her mother, and her aunt came from Cornwall to help with the family. We all know that early death and infant mortality were much greater, of course, in the Victorian period, especially in house where the drinking water actually seeped through the graveyard at the top of the hill before reaching the general population above. The uh, conditions were poor. But Charlotte's life is a bleak story by any standards. It's a story, in fact, of tenacious struggle for survival physically and psychologically, for a means to survive creatively in a world circumscribed by moral duty and by social convention in relation to women. It's a story that I set out to explore some 40 years ago, and I still marvel, as Elizabeth Gaskell did, at Charlotte Bronte's ostensibly quiet and resolute survival. Gaskell said, The wonder to me is how she can have kept heart and power alive in this life of desolation. We know now, however, from her letters and her novels that she had a tenacious and truculent spirit. There's no doubt in my mind that her writing kept her safe. It not only provided an outlet for her creative energy, but it also gave meaning and focus to her life. So when I was a PhD student at Clare Hall, I wanted to find out how she came to write these novels. Novels like Jamie, and why and how she began it. This is the house that I too came to in 1974 to begin work on the early writings of Charlotte Bronte. I worked, and still do, in the added section of the parsonage. Um, the original parsonage is this part. This is the added section where the library is. It was added just a year after the Bronte's uh, left. Mr. Bronte. Um, yes, it was built, in fact, much earlier, and this is the original. Um, you can see how exposed it is to the moors and how little um, it is in terms of vegetation. Very little was known of the Bronte's early writings at the time, and most of the manuscripts were unpublished. Even the professor who uh, first employed me at the University of New South Wales thought I was wasting my time um, actually writing a book on Charlotte Bronte's third writing. This is after I've done my PhD. He said, and I quote, 
No one would ever want to read that kid's stuff. It was extraordinary, but that's the sort of attitude at the time I had to, to fight against. Luckily, the book that I wrote won a British Academy Prize, and that was very welcome encouragement. In fact, the early writings of the juvenile were of so little value when I started to work on them that they were kept casually in drawers in the parsonage and anybody could, could have a look. Nowadays, of course, they're in a safe and their value has increased exponentially. As I found out a year ago, in fact, when somebody sent me one of the little books to verify the handwriting. Here it is here. The Bronte Museum raised £300,000 to help with the help of grants and the British Lottery. Uh, to actually bid for the manuscript. But this little book of 20 pages, written when Charlotte was only 14, sold for £691 to a French investor, more than twice the pre-sale estimate. That's the sort of thing we're up against now to try and raise funds for getting manuscripts. I had to take a trip to Paris to read and transcribe this one, because that's where it is now, in a private it's great fun when I'm asked to identify manuscripts um, and other plot and artifacts. In fact, recently I've been involved in the, um, in the acquisition of uh, a book that belonged to Mariah Bramwell Bronte, um, Charlotte Bronte's mother, and that, that, was, that was also um, extremely interesting. Uh, it was saved from a shipwreck when um, Mrs. Bronte married Mr. Bronte, and there's very few, um, um, there's very little survivor of Charlotte Bronte's mother. So this is a really precious uh, acquisition that the Bronte Museum has just got to me this year. I'm working on it at the moment. And it has about two or three manuscripts that are different to the actual book. And so I've been identifying the writer. So. When I first started my research, I found that the Bronte Museum had only a fraction of these five manuscripts. So I set out to find the rest. There was no catalogue or bibliography, so this was my first task. I combed old sales catalogues in libraries and museums and traced um, many of the early sales of Bronte memorabilia in the United States. And it seems that local Howarth residents, especially the Bronte servants, have been very keen to sell any relics relating now to the now famous Brontes. Even the stalks that they sat on and pieces of wood from their window frames. <laughs> I raised funds with, um, from a few small grants that I got. There was very little for students in those days. But I will mention that Claire Paul gave me £100 and I was absolutely <laughs> delighted because I only needed three money to get across the Atlantic <laughs> so, and then to go around America by great on bus. Uh, so that was, that was wonderful that Claire Paul helped come to the rescue. Then I travelled the length and breadth of the States and Canada, as I say, on Greyhound bus, knocking on doors of private collectors and ferreting in libraries and archives in other countries. It was a very exciting journey. I found over 100 unpublished Bronte manuscripts and an equal number of unknown drawings and paintings by the Brontes. These were all things that people had never considered in collections in those days. I even found her engaged with the in one collection. <coughs> and it was together with um, a miniature booklet that I was working on and also an ivory calling card case. They're now in the Bronte Museum. I was lucky enough to be able to persuade a lot of private collectors to actually give the material to the Bronte Parsonage. There was a good deal of detective work to do. Unscrupulous de dealers and collectors had deliberately divided and misattributed manuscripts to increase their value. For example, I was able to match up fragmentary pages of a long poem in the British Library with the rest of the poem that was in the Princeton University Library. That's just one instance, the type of thing I had to do. And because all the Bronte children wrote in a very similar minuscule hand, Dealers were able to pass off the less valuable brother Bramwell's manuscripts as those of Charlotte and Newman. After studying the handwriting, I was able to sort out the ownership and found that uh, libraries, many libraries and collectors, 
had often unwittingly acquired the wrong manuscripts. There have been earlier scholars before me whose work was invaluable, but they had worked with only a few manuscripts that had been available to them at the time, and they had taken the attributions of their study. Gradually, I pieced together and arranged chronologically all the extant manuscripts, and I was able to then understand the very complex imaginary world, that literary world, that is described in this series of manuscripts. This is, of course, the now famous Bronte Juvenilia, Tales of Glastown, Angria, and Gondor, the creative play that the Brontes established as children and that they then continued to write about well into their adult years. I think Emily was still writing, after one in height, she's still writing from the material. Um, Charlotte finished at the age of 24. Brandon kept writing until his death, 31. Yeah, this a sample of the earliest little booklets. They are literally this big, like large postage stamps. But the early manuscripts amount in words to more than all the published novels put together. Brown's writings are even more voluminous, but no prose manuscripts of Emily and Dan survived, only their poems and diary papers. And they can all be found in this little volume that I did for um, Oxford World Classics relatively recently, if anybody's interested. Charlotte's role was actually one of the leader. Uh, she was initially in partnership with her brother Bramble, should we say rivalry with her brother Bramble. The younger sisters broke away to uh, form their own world of Gondol, the Gondol saga, um, and Charlotte and Bramble developed what we call the Glass Town and Angry Song. So. The earliest booklets are, as I said, tiny hand sewn booklets. They're as small as a large postage stamp with rough paper covers from recycled wrapping paper, sugar bags, um, advertisements, whatever they could lay hands on. Paper was, of course, scarce and expensive in those days. And Charlotte couldn't have fit as many as a hundred words onto a page like one of these. The tiny, minuscule script was written actually in imitation of newspaper print. It was difficult to read often without a magnifying glass, making this the reason I read glasses now, actually. I was fine when I started. Um, but it makes the manuscripts, in fact, illegible to adult eyes, and I think this is one of the reasons to help maintain secrecy for the children within the family. Mr. Bronte had very bad eyes. In fact, he had the third, one of the first cataract operations without any sitting um, when Charlotte was a little bit older. And he simply couldn't read anything that they wrote, so they were safe. Um, and I also suspect it's the main reason why I found so many unpublished manuscripts that other scholars hadn't got. So I was, I was lucky. Young Charlotte was intensely interested also in the, her actual, the actual production of writing, the mechanics of it. She even recorded the pages, the number of pages that she wrote at a particular time. I don't know if you can see there, this is blown up, of course. And this is at the end of one of her volumes on uh, Tales of the Islanders, which was one of her plays. And she says, I began in the script then, not in the I began this volume. Um, on May the 3rd, 1830, and finished on Saturday, May 8th, 1830. So she, she actually records exactly what she's doing all the time, which makes it very easy for a scholar who's tracing when she, what she's doing and when she's doing it. At the age of 14, she actually drew up a catalogue of my books, recording 22 volumes of tales, dramas, poems, and novelettes, uh, referring to her manic writing as scribble mania. She imitated the title pages of books on her father's shelves and the style and satiric banter of adult newspapers and magazines, especially Blackwood's Edinburgh magazine, which the family The title page of her story, The Search After Happiness, for example, jokingly records a tale by Charlotte Bronte printed by herself and sold by nobody. And she continues to experiment throughout her early writings, 
the form and style with ironic narrators, in fact, who set up, send up rather, the romantic and political machinations of her imaginary characters. As she grew older, her pages became larger, but her minuscule writing remained the same. We have here a page from The Green Dwarf. This is um, approximately, approximately this size, and you can see it has about four or five hundred points. <coughs> the content of these manuscripts <coughs> is a powerful record of the liberating effect of the literary play. Like all normal children, Charlotte and her siblings' earliest games were physical. They were totally normal kids. They imitated the adult world by acting out histories, stories they had gleaned chiefly from Sir Walter Scott's novels, battle scenes from military gazettes, and political reports from the local newspapers. Mr. Bronte's gift to Bramwell were 12 wooden toy soldiers on the 5th of June, 1826, was the catalyst that initiated the most famous of the Brontes plays, which was the Young Men's Play, that eventually grew into the sagas of Glass Town and Danville. Charlotte records the event in which she dramatically seized early one morning these soldiers that were at Blamwell's bedside when he woke up on his birthday, and she yelled, This is the Duke of Wellington, this shall be mine. And she had an absolute hero worship for the Duke of Wellington, and so did her father. And this was to be her favourite character. From then on, she wrote about him, about his sons, about everything she could find out about his life, and turned it into fiction. Bramwell chose his protagonist in the recent Peninsula Wars, Napoleon Bonaparte, and so began the literary rivalry, and you can see how it might have developed, that played with revolutionary ideas, experimented with empire building, with military and mercantile expansion, with print culture, so a lot of that, a lot of um, about writing and printing and publishing, uh, and social mores. They founded fictitious uh, um, kingdoms in Africa, set round about um, round about Nigeria, about there, right? And these are the kingdoms that they, they established, and colonizing, of course, as they. British contemporaries were doing at the time. And they founded these, and they modelled them, in fact, to the countries on the British Isles, uh, with equivalents of Scotland, England, Wales, and Ireland. And their enemy was on the island here, down here, and predictably it was called French England. <laughs> they invented not only public but private lives for their chief men who morphed into the Byronic heroes, the Duke of Zamora and Alexander Percy. Uh, Percy was based on the Northumberland Percy's, I don't know if you know about them, and Annick Castle, and of course mentioned in Shakespeare's history of this, they went all of Shakespeare, and Shakespeare's very much in the Shakespeare, centenary at the moment, as well. Throughout her stories, Charlotte's focus is on, in fact, high life, the high life of Verdopolis, which was her favourite city, which was an equivalent of London, an imaginary London, in the Glass Town Federation. And in fact, one of her stories is called High Life in Vidopolis. It's a manuscript from the British Library that they got me to publish. And they printed it as a nice little gift book on me. Um, there were many manuscripts that have been published now. Her sardonic narrator, it's always a male, male voice, traces the despotic political and sexual power of her husband <coughs> Zamorna, King of Anglia, and his relationship with his several wives and mistresses. Here he is, um, illustrated by Charlotte at the age of 17. He's especially, he's, he's surprisingly feminine in all of her earlier, earlier pictures. Bramwell, of course, makes him much more than Charlotte prefers. In her late teens and early twenties, Charlotte's focus actually changes as she matures. And it changes more to an awareness of the fate of women associated with Zamora. 
Um, his first wife, Marion Hume, whom Charlotte illustrated by copying one of Finden's engravings of the Countess of Jersey. And that's Charlotte's copy. Um, you can see how detailed and fine it is. Minna Lowry, the most uh, loyal of Byron's mistress, of Zamanda's mistresses. Um, and here we see her copied. That's Charlotte's copy. Uh, from an engraving, uh, again illustrating the Maid of Saragossa in one of Byron's poems. Uh, Charlotte has changed the original plate, again by Finden, and put some very fashionable curls at the side, and you can see she's wearing makeup, which isn't in the original, but otherwise it's, it's, it's a copy from one of Byron's poems. And also the adolescent Caroline Vernon, illegitimate daughter of Simona's father-in-law and ward of Simona, uh, whose seduction by her guardian we witness, and that's very interesting manuscript. And finally, Elizabeth, oh, sorry, I haven't got Finally, Elizabeth Hastings, uh, who's not painted by Charlotte Monty, <coughs> that's the reason it's not here, obviously, uh, but much more significant, since she's a governess who is actually a prototype of the small, plain, <coughs> ambitious, and self-reliant heroine of Germany. So we see in the juvenile, it's just to give you a glimpse of what I'm working with, we see then her gradually tracing her her own attitude to women. So she's she's immersed in Byronic romance to begin with, and then she's actually analysing this heroine's response and the way in which they might respond to their lovers or husbands. One of the joys of searching for manuscripts meant that I also found unknown drawings and paintings like the ones that I've been showing you. Again, no one had bothered to take them seriously at the time or to relate visual to Charlotte's writing. Yet it is clear, I think, from a study of her drawing that it had a profound effect on her style and conception of writing. From an early age, she had drawing lessons at home with her siblings she copied art manuals, and she laboured hard at school to acquire the correct techniques of art at that period for women, women who wanted to um, attain an accomplishment. She began copying from the books on her father's bookshelves, the Buick that I showed you earlier, Little Ruins here, um, often based on Gilpin's pictures, manuals, cottages. But these are all at the age of 12. Uh, then she copied also from drawing manuals, from magazines and decorative annuals of the time. And here we have Bessie Bell and Mary Gray, which was done by Charlotte at 14 years old, from one of the annuals, one of those annuals that people like Wordsworth, Shelley, all wrote for, but they were mostly as gift books for women, these particular books. And this is what Charlotte had as well. During her brief period of schooling at Rowan Head, she worked hard on her art lessons, rigorously following these prescribed steps um, for young women. First, the requisite studies. Here is one she did of eyes, of noses, and profiles of heads. And then for portraits. This is from a cartoon by Raphael that she copied. And another one here, just to give you an idea, from a detail, in fact, that she copied from uh, Raphael's Madonna of the Fish. And then she moved, as women did at the time, to drawing landscapes. And here she is, this is her copy of <coughs> Wordsworth's home, Cockermouth, in the Lake District. And it's typical, this one, of the meticulous copy of Copperplate. Engraving. Charlotte describes this laborious copy in her last novel, Villette, and the heroine Lucy Snow talks of copying in a line, a line engraving, tediously working up my copy to the finish of the original. And Charlotte realizes, of course, as Lucy Snow does in the book, that this isn't a career for her, but in fact, she should do something. One of my most exciting discoveries in this particular field was, one, was the fact that Charlotte had actually exhibited two drawings in a major national art exhibition in Leeds. 
1834, when she was 18. They were Kirkstall Abbey and Bolton Abbey. Typical picturesque landscapes minutely copied from engravings of scenes by turn. This is Kirkstall Abbey. But she, this is her copy. I remember being incredibly excited when I actually found her name in the list of people who had exhibited. Totally unthought of, you know, nobody had any idea that she had actually exhibited this. It was the 1834 Summer Exhibition for the Royal Northern Society for the Improvement for the Encouragement of the Fine Arts. It's quite a mouthful. And here was proof, indeed, that she had wanted to be a visual artist. I think, in fact, she wanted to be a miniaturist because she suffered from myopia and this would have accommodated her problem with her eyes. She apparently had to read everything this close. She was, didn't want to wear her glasses and they were much more familiar. Her delicate flower painting um, are equally competent. Her delicate flower paintings, they're equally competent, but they're also typical of accomplishment art that most ladies performed in the period. Take, for example, her roses here and also convolvulus, all painted in 1832 when she was 16. Meticulously copied not from nature but from contemporary environments. There are no imaginative surprises in the Bronte art camp, such as we find in her early writings, which are really quite revolutionary and experimental. There are no surrealistic images such as those that Rochester discovers in Jane's portfolio in Jane. Charlotte Bronte eventually realised that her forte lay in writing rather than painting. But her experience of painting was not wasted. It laid the foundation, I believe, for her artistic principles in writing. And it allowed her to become an expert in word painting, a phrase that the Famous critic George Henry Lewis, George Henry's partner, used when he praised what he said was the deep, significant reality of Jane. Speaking not only of characters and incidents in the novel, but also of descriptions of nature and of houses and rooms and furniture in that novel, he said, the pictures stand out distinctly before you. They are pictures and not mere bits of fine writing. Throughout her teenage years, Charlotte was acutely conscious that she must earn her own living. Her keen awareness of family responsibilities and the need for financial security was reinforced by evangelical ideas of female meekness, moral rectitude, and domestic duty. At the age of 19, she felt obliged to return to Roadwood School as a teacher, as she had previously been there as a pupil for one and a half years old. She had really only one and a half years old. This is a picture she did of the school, which is still there, and it's now a handicapped. The salary was used to defray the costs of her sister's education at the same school, and she, of course, did nothing for herself. Without the freedom of home to write, she felt trapped in a life of drudgery. Her anger in writing disintegrated into fitful visions that are all recorded in six semi-autobiographical manuscripts during moments of rest from teaching duties. It's <coughs> one of the manuscripts. Uh, these particular manuscripts um, are only fragments and only a couple of them had been recorded um, or had been published when I started. Um, but I was able to transcribe and to publish them in their entirety. And they are, in fact, the most important evidence we have of Charlotte's frustration and mental distress as a teacher. She writes, and I've put this up for you, she writes, and this is just to give you an example of all these autobiographical fragments of life, the thought came over me. Am I to spend the best part of my life in this wretched bondage forcibly suppressing my rage at the idleness, the apathy, and the hyperbolical and most asinine stupidity of those fat-headed oafs <laughs> pupils, and on compulsion assuming an air of kindness 
patience and assiduity. <laughs> the need to dissemble, and this is in Jane Eyre's works, in fact, all in all branches of novels. The need to dissemble, to assume a mask in life, became an unbearable strain for, for a young woman. Her fantasies, her angry fantasies of power and hero worship, seemed an inappropriate now for this, this young woman. And she felt guilty. She felt it was impossible to relinquish what she called the bright, darling dream. This is her saga that she writes. She feared that her obsession with Zamorna, the hero, smacked of idolatry and sensuality. These are very interesting passages. She records moments of divine leisure that acted like opium. Some have suggested, in fact, that she might have used opium, certainly her brother Brandon did. Opium to whirl her away to anger and to relief from her teaching. Their interruption by an unsuspecting pupil was akin to physical violence. And in one particular time, when somebody asks her a question, she says, I should have vomited. I thought I should have vomited. The nature of her visions made her feel sinful, and angry becomes what she calls an infernal world, or a world below. The conflict between her deep need for creative expression and her profound guilt about it was only resolved when she departed from Rohit at the end of three and a half years. Twice more in the next few years, Charlotte forced herself to become a governess in private homes, but she never lasted long at the job. She was profoundly shy of strangers, she hated living in other people's houses, and she disliked children. So, you know, absolutely disastrous recipe for, for a teacher, for a <laughs> Her letters bear witness to overwork and to humiliation of having to live, make her living amongst people who she considered her intellectual feelings. And we see this in the letters. But her experience has made her more aware of the quality of a single educated woman in society. The personal anguish that she endured as governess allowed her to explore ideas involving the tension between passion and restraint that actually form the basis of um, her fictional representations of similar crises in all her novels. Throughout her struggles, Charlotte never wavered from the determination to make something of herself. She was keenly aware, you might say um, pathologically aware, of her lack of physical charm. So she had very little faith in the marriage market. This is what she thought of herself. It's really extremely sad. Here she is over here, <coughs> saying goodbye to her best friend, Ellen Nussi, who's got some bow at the time. And she's in, over across the Atlantic at this particular time, when she went to Brussels. This is what she thinks of herself. And you see this throughout her writing, it's, it's, it's really quite sad. Harriet Martineau um, described her as the smallest creature I've ever seen, except as a queen. And Charlotte realised that she must rely, in fact, more on her own fortitude and to cultivate what talents she had. If she couldn't be a visual artist, perhaps she could be a writer. When she was 20, she boldly solicited Robert Salvey's opinion of her poetry. Her letter hasn't survived, but his reply, um, but from his reply to her, which we do have, it seems that she sent some of her vers verses, mentioning her imaginative visions and speaking of her ambition to be forever known as a poet. His advice against the dangers of habitual daydreams and his discouragement of her writing for publication might have crushed the lesser spirit. He said, and this is very famous, literature cannot be the business of a woman's life, and it ought not to be. Salvi was actually extremely well meaning, and in defense of Salvi, I might say, the rest of the letter shows real concern for Charlotte, and she did appreciate this. She actually wrote when she kept the letter, a letter from Salvi to be kept forever. So she, she really did value 
And of course, his was the conventional Victorian procedure against women writers that she and other writers were up against. An opinion which only increased her frustration at the limits put on women's capacity to both earn a living and to earn distinction. She was grateful for Sadi's acknowledgement, as I've just said, and her reply carefully notes that he did not actually forbid her to write. She's very careful about this. She says, you do not actually forbid me to write. So, as long as she did not neglect her real duties, she could keep writing. And on the basis of this justification, of course, she did so. Her letters at the time expressed her wish for wings. She was acutely conscious of talents unexercised and a thirst for knowledge unquenched. So she persuaded her aunt to provide the finance for Emily and herself to travel to a school in Brussels to improve their languages. The idea was that with better qualifications, the Brontes could set up their own school and not have to go and work for other people. They could run their own lives. Um, Emily, unfortunately, left after a year, and Charlotte stayed for a second year as both pupil and English teacher at the French school. She was inspired by her um, teacher's husband, who also taught some classes, Constantine and Jean. Um, she was particularly innovative in his teaching methods and could get her to get the pupils to actually imitate French verbs. Uh, it was a method that wasn't used to us at the time. And his lessons in composition and literary analysis taught her to exercise control over her own writing and style. She became absolutely devoted to this fascinating teacher and returned his genuine enthusiasm for her intellectual progress with a hero worship that actually bordered her on the session. She did fall in love with him. A man who was a strict Catholic married to her employer and with the young family. And Madame Ege, an astute woman and pregnant at the time, became correspondingly more remote and suspicious. And you'll be recognizing here the plot of Villette, if you've read that particular book. Without Emily, Charlotte already felt desperately isolated as a Protestant in a foreign country, a Roman Catholic country, she suffered what, she, what we would call nowadays a serious depression. Alone in the summer vacation, her loneliness and mental torture became too much for her, and she wandered the streets. And once, finding herself outside of the Catholic Cathedral of St. Peru, vehement Protestant that she was, she had an absolutely overwhelming um, need to make confession. And she later used this situation to powerful effect in Philippe. By the end of the year, Charlotte had returned home shaken, she said, in heart and mind. Her depression continued when Hege failed to respond to her letters. Her burning need for some sign of recognition from her old master, nobody had ever taken any interest in her before, so it was really quite sad. Um, and her burning need or some sign of recognition was revealed in the few surviving examples of the many passionate letters that she wrote to him. They are absolutely remarkable artifacts. Torn up, thrown in the bin by Ejeli, he never got the time, rescued and sewn together by Han, by his wife, in case they were needed later as evidence for her husband's innocence. <laughs> oh, this, is, this is actually much better if we had better art, I'm sorry. Um, well, anyway, you can see a faint outline, you can see the tears, and it shows the stitching quite well. Sorry, but actually, there's a picture of one of them in the book that um, is, is down the back, if you're interested. Um, okay, they're now in the British Library, and this particular one is on display at the Bicentenary Exhibition at the Bronte Parsonage at the moment. Charlotte eventually alleviated her depression through writing and through the prospect of authorship. First came the publication of a volume of poems by all three of the Bronte sisters in 1846, and then Charlotte wrote four novels, as I'm sure you know. The Professor, not published until after her death. Jane Eyre, 
the first page of the manuscript, um, an autobiography, an immediate success, and of course, um, heavily criticized by reviewers who saw it as subversive and right. And this here is the, as I say, the initial page. I'm working on this at the moment for a new edition for um, Cambridge University Press. Um, and the manuscript is action on display at the moment in the British Library. Shirley, the third novel, a novel that celebrates the need for activity in women's lives and the right to self-respect in work. And finally, Villette, based on the Brussels experience and told by an older heroine, Lucy Snow, made cold and duplicitous by her first time. Through Lucy Snow, Charlotte expressed the bitterness of her resentment at having to live what she called a very dark. We know, however, that at the end, very end of her life, Charlotte achieved some measure of genuine personal happiness when, at the age of 38, she married her father's curate, the Reverend Arthur Bill Nichols. It's one of those bitter ironies of life that she died within a year of her marriage, of nausea in the early stages of pregnancy. So, to conclude. If I've had a theme at all in this talk, it's to convey Charlotte Bronte's willingness to use her creative talent, and especially her fiction, to work through a life that presented her with a relentless series of obstacles and disappointments. My recent work on a co-authored study of Jane Eyre in relation to Charlotte's life has confirmed my admiration for the moral courage and tenacious spirit expressed in the novel journey. A spirit developed from a very early age. And I've been fortunate, I think, to have worked on especially the amazingly energetic and experimental creativeness of um, daring, in fact, early writing, with its playful and often ironic narrators. And it's a, they document, I think, the happiest years of Charlotte Monty's life that spill over in so many ways to Jane. So let me leave you with this final image that was chosen by the Bronte Museum for Charlotte's Bicentenary. It was painted several years after her death by John Hunter Thompson, who was a friend of Bramwell Bronte, and who knew Charlotte Bronte well. It's rather flattering, but then all the portraits of Charlotte Bronte appear to be very flattering. And as you can see, it's also a cover that was chosen for the book. that's just been published for the Bicentenary. And it's used to, we're using it to raise money for the museum. So if any of you are interested, we've got some on sale down the back there. I think it's 20 pounds. And it's full of illustrations of the Brontes about Jane Eyre and about transforming life into literature. And uh, you'll be able to learn a lot more about Charlotte Bronte there than I've been able to do with that. Thank you.